Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Room. Today I'm here at the Washington Street Book and Antique Shop. It's their 31st anniversary. Right, I'm gonna take you a tour inside. All right, I'm here with John, the owner. Hey John, say hi to everyone. Hey, hi you guys. This is, I'm John Klesavage. We own Washington Street Books and Entertainment Museum in downtown Have the Grace. We've been here for 31 years and we started collecting movie costumes about 20 years ago. Um, unlike anything, you, you have to have that one moment in time that changes everything. And mine was that my son turned to me one day and said, uh, you can't collect any more movie costumes until you start displaying them. So eight years ago, we started putting out costumes. We bought three glass cases like this and we went from having three on display to 50 on display. We went from having roughly 30 costumes in our collection to having over 1,500. So be careful when your children tell them not to do something because <laughs> it changes the whole world. So anyway, uh, welcome to our store. We uh, display a little bit of everything. We try to change out our exhibits about roughly every three months. Uh, this month is the exhibit for the movie Respect with Jennifer Hudson. We have eight of her original dresses on display. The rarest is this one right here. It's referred to as the Amsterdam dress. It is 25 pounds of Zagorski crystals and pearls. It took three months to make. It's estimated about $35,000. Yeah, it's if you get really close on it, the detail on them, thousands and thousands of pearls on it. It, it took just months to create. Um, Next to it, we have this beautiful blue poster. This is actually uh, one of the two. Uh, this blue poster is actually that blue dress that's over there in the corner. And then we also have some of the main pieces like that beautiful gold dress there that is used in all the trailers for the film and also used in the film as her birthday dress. Uh, it's quite beautiful. She sparkles in it, but um, she, uh, if you pull up the trailer for the movie Respect, you'll see her standing on stage and singing in that. Over here, uh, we have uh, the finale dress. This one is actually worn at the very end when she's singing Amazing Grace and she's come back to the church and everything else like that. They're really quite beautiful. Uh, these are all designed by a costume designer by the name of Clint Ramos. He's a phenomenal Broadway designer. And then most of the dress is actually created by Eric Winterling, who's a top New York dressmaker. So she got like the best of the best. I believe the quote was about 85 costumes he designed for her. I think they ended up using 52 or 54 of them. We own eight of them, which is uh, surprisingly the most value of all this collection. And this is about a $65,000 group of dresses and costumes. Uh, but um, it's amazing how beautiful and how detailed they are but we do have some of the rarest pieces if you come down a little bit further down this way we'll show you the Egyptian dress um, this one was created for a scene where she falls off stage and um, they created actually two of these this is quite heavy it's all sequins uh, beautiful wings that come down the back and in the scene she's inebriated uh, in that time of her life and she falls off this off the stage and uh, so they created what they call a stunt version which is pretty cool these are some of the detail and the costume designs that they did which is always wonderful to see the drawings and then to actually see the creation which comes from it. Uh, yeah, it really is. It's, it's quite stunning and everything else like that. So this particular exhibit focused mostly on um, the movie Respect, but also focused on the beautiful dresses of Jennifer Hudson. So to extend that, uh, we went a little bit further. Now, here's another real beauty. This one here is Mary J. Balazs' dress. Uh, she has two major costumes in the film. This is the one in the very beginning when she's performing and uh, when Aretha is performing and very young and you can see her in, it, in the picture there. Also the beauty of these particular ensembles is they really did them up with rhinestones so that they sparkle. Uh, this one's kind of unique because if you look at the beautiful boa, it's actually wired on so that it stands out from the dress. It wouldn't doesn't lie flat and they added rhinestones on the wire so that as you move it picks up the sparkle and everything else of it so which is really gorgeous. So these are a couple of the other really gorgeous pieces that are from that collection. Uh, a little bit further over here this is her Paris dress when she's singing in Paris. 
and this has the three background singers behind it which are really gorgeous so this kind of gives you a feeling because whenever you're seeing a lot of the pieces she's wearing she usually has a background group we have several ensembles but as you can see it takes up a lot of area to display it you have to have four enough room for four different pieces if you come through here on this side we went to the next extreme so of course she became world famous for winning the Oscar in Dreamgirls. So this is her costume for Effie. This is in the scene where they're riding in the back of the Cadillac and they're hearing their song Cadillac on the radio for the very first time and they're just screaming. Uh, for, and they have to turn around on the bridge because they're running out of reception from yes. the radio. Uh, this is Beyonce's costume. Um, on screen there's a scene where they start traveling all over the world and they show all three girls wearing different costumes from different places. Some from China, these ones for India and everything else and this is the one that Beyonce wears and this stuff. So as part of the exhibit uh, we also did an extension of Black History and then on the, so on the other side we have things from uh, the great debaters with Denzel Washington and uh, the beautiful uh, costume here uh, which is by, worn by uh, uh, Samantha which is uh, Journey costume and you can see all period and everything else like this they're quite rare to find anything from the great debater so it's pretty cool so in this one exhibit we tried to cover everything from respect to extenuation to uh, um, Jennifer Hudson with her other costumes and then Black History Month but in about uh, three or four weeks we will shift um, and go I just had a knee operation so that's why I'm using a walker mm -hmm. but uh, this will all shift to Hunger Games we hope to have 50 individual costumes out from Hunger Games alone it'll be pretty phenomenal but if you come down here we'll see if we can I get definitely have a lot of Hunger Game fans well so. I hate to tell you this we have enough to knock your socks off we have close to 60 costumes in our collection wow. these are some of the rarest uh, only because they're from the first film the story goes that, like most things, when films come out for the first time, nobody knows whether the film's going to be a success or not. Mm -hmm. Lionsgate definitely didn't know whether, you know, Hunger Games was going to go the way it did. And, you know, you look at a lot of these trilogies that the first one comes out and then it doesn't go anywhere. And there are a lot of examples of that, which is sad because, like, Beautiful Creatures is one of the other collections we collect. Only did the one film, but it could have been three films in itself. Easily. But, but Hunger Games, they put all the costumes up for auction, not knowing, I think, that there was going to be the success that it was and 225 of the top costumes were chosen and they were put into an auction called Black Sparrow auctions and Black Sparrow advertised and everything else like that well of course when things exploded the way they did some of the costumes that they sold were things they needed for the second and third film uh, the hunting jacket and everything else like that so they had to actually recreate them so the, the original stuff the most expensive was the fire dress it sold for $250,000 plus a $50,000 premium but what makes most of these costumes, except for uh, this one here, uh, these are all from the first film, and these are mostly from the Black Sparrow auctions. The beautiful Rue costume was their interview costume. Uh, Jennifer Hudson's costume of her on the train coming back with Peta. Um, Lenny Kravitz's costume. Um, where they play cinema. Uh, what's really fascinating is that when you start collecting costumes, you start to realize that there's a lot of detail that is often missed uh, when you see them on screen because they go by so quickly or the lighting is such that it doesn't show up. In the case of Lenny Kravitz, this is a Givenchy jacket. It's actually leopard skin if you look closely at it. You and see then, it. Yeah, and you don't notice that when you're watching it, but when you go back and watch the films again, you'll catch the light, you'll see that it is. Yeah. The jacket alone was $5,000. The boots are Gucci, they were at the grand. And the pants and everything else, whole ensemble was probably around six or 7,000. So. So uh, it's quite beautiful. We always say that Lenny Kravitz got the best clothing. Yes, you know? I can see. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of these costumes that were handmade, but Lenny Kravitz got the really expensive one. Now, the beautiful Caesar Flickman here, I don't know if you can get it because you're kind of close here, but the purple one, this is from Catching Fire. This is from the second film. About 15 minutes in, 
they flash to Victor's village and Jennifer Lawrence comes out and meets Peta and she falls down in the snow and as she does they flash back to the capital and Caesar Flickman played by uh, Stanley Tucci is uh, wearing this particular costume which is quite beautiful and quite uh, stunning in its designs and everything else like that. Now what's cool in all this stuff is that as you fall in love with it the history behind it is quite fascinating. So the story goes that when they're going from drawings to actual creation of the costume, sometimes they're not sure whether it's going to look the same or feel the same. Yeah. And so they'll do what's referred to as a mock-up or a prototype. This is the mock-up for Peter's jacket for the chariot. Uh, what they did is they took a regular jacket and they uh, stitched on uh, different pleatings and the leather materials to see how it would look from the drawings that they did in two dimensions to three dimensions. And they stitched on the collar. Um, what's really fascinating is if you look closely on the what would be his left shoulder um, this particular piece on the bottom is actually snake skin and that's what they ended up going with with the material that you see in the final result of this but typically the prototypes are lost or destroyed uh, they're uh, usually held on to so we were really thankful to actually get this piece which was really cool this is uh, uh, Seneca Crane's costume the game maker um, we own both uh, the full costume plus we own the back backup shirts and pants which is pretty cool for it another one of those things that has its own uniqueness in the pinhole of the buttonhole you can see a little piece of white fabric and that actually shows up with him on screen there again when you look at it it's quite dark it almost looks black but it's actually a pinstripe red and uh, these are the unique things that really make a difference when you start to see them in person as you start to really realize the detail that you wouldn't have noticed necessarily um, the other thing that's kind of fascinating um, is that in the first film, Hunger Games, you also have this training center and you have the trainers. They're the ones who are telling the competitors that if they don't learn how to make fire, that they may die from natural causes and so forth. The trainers just have the Imperial seal on them and they have no numbers at all. And this is a trainer costume, which is pretty cool. And then this, we believe, was a pre-production piece. We have not been able to find out a lot about it, but we think that in the beginning, they were trying to come up with the idea how they were going to create the mutts. Uh -huh. And so they actually created a human. This has a helmet that a human and a body suit that could be worn to kind of get feel for shape and movement and everything else like that but eventually they CGI'd it and then we have the drawings from the original creation of that which is pretty cool like that so these eight costumes from Hunger Games although they're the only ones out right now are really really important pieces but we'll be adding another 40 maybe 50 pieces to it and we have some ones we think that'll knock people's socks off that's gonna be next month uh, it's, yes it's roughly gonna take me uh, about another three weeks before I'm able to bend down and rearrange everything and it'll probably take close to three weeks to assemble the collection it takes about three hours per costume to change them out and break down the one that's in there and put the new one on and then photograph it and do the write-ups and stuff so it should be really cool now i have a question how do yeah. you store them in between before well, you, you put them out well there's a whole variety of different ways of doing that um like anybody you know if you had a fortune um there would be archival boxes and everything else like that and uh, uh, the hard part is is that you try to find a balance with someone like us where we have 1500 costumes um, we do is we bag and board and uh, create individual boxes for each one mm -hmm. and then as you can look along here these are all individual costumes and everything else like that so it's you try to keep them in a in a proper humidity proper um, uh, temperature so they're not getting drastic changes and so forth like that and you have some things you'll bag uh, like clothing bags but a lot of that can weight can really push down on the shoulders and stuff like that mm -hmm. so a lot of times mostly we'll use boxing okay. now so, now John I have a lot of horror fans I see this piece right here I see the carry 2013 yeah this is one of the rare pieces that we have this is about a $10,000 dress this is used in the very final scenes of the film um, this one's quite special, uh, covered in blood, very, very thick and everything else like that. It's, it's probably one of the best examples of the pieces out there. It's uh, really, really beautiful. Uh, one of my favorites. So a friend of mine, uh, we brought it in for Halloween one year and uh, 
she was kind enough to sell it to us and uh, I've never wanted to give it up after that. Which it's <laughs> amazing. Yeah, we have some really good horror and stuff. We, like I said, we try to rotate our costumes so that we have new examples all the time. This exhibit will stay up a little bit longer. It's coming out only because the new film for Hunger Games, uh, Ballad of Songbirds, and snakes will be coming out November the 17th so we're pushing to try to keep everything so when people come in they'll be just blown away by the exhibits. Now if you're local right now we also have Edgar Allan Poe's costume from Altered Carbon. This one's quite rare. It was filmed up in Canada. It was a really great series on Netflix. I uh, made two seasons there again and there were three books they could have gone for a third one but the two seasons were really well done and this is one of the major costumes of course local being Poe being really important. Now, these will all shift out, but these are some of the more important pieces too. We have uh, from The Notebook, Rachel McAdams costume. We have Mia Wachowski's costume from uh, Madame Bovary, which is the one she actually dies in. You can actually see it at the very beginning of the film and the very end of the film, because they do kind of a, an homage in the beginning where she falls down after drinking poison. And you can see a picture of her wearing that there. These beautiful costumes are all from the film Beautiful Creatures. Uh, we own probably one of the largest private collections, probably close to 35 or 40 costumes from this film. It's um, really magnificent costuming, quality is amazing, and uh, I really enjoyed the film. I wish they had continued it made more. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. So, um, well, let me walk you over to another section, show you a couple other examples. Now, we mostly deal in costumes because of the fact that that's our love. We like the tactileness of it and everything else like that. But we also try to supplement it with some of the props. This is a rational hovercraft chair. Uh, these were, they actually used uh, NASCAR chairs and when you watch the film where they're being taken out to the arena, flown out, you can actually see them sitting in each of these chairs. They're all stainless steel, cold and and psychologically it's pretty cool because you're putting someone in a cold dank chair, separating them from everybody yeah. else and sending them to their death, which is pretty wild when you think about it. It's pretty cool. And you see you have a lot of collectibles, oh, figure yeah. rings. Let's take a quick walk over here to show. We have a little bit of everything. Yes. A lot of collectible Star Wars figures. Oh yeah, Star Wars, and then we have life-size figures. Uh, the, some of the rarest is the one right above your head, which is the Millennium Falcon. Um, literally above your head here. <laughs> Whoa, and that, how did I miss that? That is, uh, was created by Toys R Us. There were only 600 of those produced. They light up. Uh, the hard part was is that you couldn't buy them, you had to win them. So oftentimes when people want them, they get a call from Toys R Us, come pick up your six foot by four foot Millennium Falcon and then <laughs> one, no way of transporting it. And two, when they got home, their wife said, there's no way in hell you're putting that up yeah. on my ceiling. So, uh, and we believe today there's probably less than 250 in existence. They're about $7,000. Super and then, cool. Then if you look over to here, hanging from the ceiling, you'll see Watto. That was done by Pepsi. They did promotional items for episode one. Um, also in the front window of our store you'll see a Darth Maul figure that's seven feet tall and to your left, straight back, uh, you'll see Anakin Skywalker. So, uh, he was done uh, separately as a promotional piece. Um, they were put in like Montgomery Wars. There were only 800 of those created. Probably less than 450 uh, in existence of that town too. So whatever you like to collect, you oh. have it. Well, we try to, but uh, I think it's uh, called Big Kid Toys. You know, you gotta love all this stuff, and if you love it, you keep bringing it in because you figure everybody else is gonna love it as much as you do. <laughs> the hard part, I think, is, is that um, the costumes are the things that you sometimes can find yourself really wrapped up in, and um, it's very easy to spend a lot of money on those very quickly, so. Can definitely see that. Yeah, so <laughs> my wife thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> but uh, you know, it has allowed us to meet some very unusual people. Uh, we call us the Wall Fame. So we have people like John Rassenberger from Cheers. We have uh, Marty Bass from Channel 13 News. Bo Willimon from House of Cards. We have Danny Hutton down here from Three Dog Night. Uh, we have a whole variety of different people that have come through at different times. And uh, Rumor Mills and Jared Harris when they were filming, filming from within uh, across the street. So, you know, all that adds to the excitement and the joy of uh, sharing with everybody because our whole dream is that as you watch a film after you've seen the costumes that you'll look at it differently you'll look and go i remember that costume or oh wow look at the texture on that so the next time they pick up and turn on a tv you'll go man look at the cool costumes behind that yes. and if we can do that and get you to rethink it you know not just think about the acting or the actor or the storyline but the beauty that goes on behind the scenes and all those people People that do all that work will get credit and people will realize how special they are. It I, really makes a big difference. I definitely agree. Oh yeah, it's really cool. Question for you, John. Yeah. They were just asking if we have any El Drain no. magic. Do you have a list? And for all of you uh, big fans. Oh well, yeah, well. We definitely have plenty of them here. Yeah. Well, we started, if you can imagine, as a photography studio 31 years ago on the 5th of May. So we just turned 31. Uh, at the time, I dreamed that we'd have photography in front and the back of our store and antiques in front. And within four months, my wife gave birth to our first child and suddenly had a baby and a camera, a baby and a camera. Gave up the camera, kept the baby, and we realized we have to give up the studio. So we started, books were something I adored. So this is our oldest book now. This one dates uh, 1585. It's a beautiful book on Roman law written in Latin. Uh, the ones below it are early dictionaries from the late 1700s. And we have uh, also a first edition, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which was done as an advertisement piece and then the coolest thing is the purse from uh, hairspray signed by John Waters uh, the 1988 version which is really cool and it was used on screen too so we try to collect some really beautiful books we also have early maps like this map over here dates from 1640 it is a hand colored map done of China which is really gorgeous with the beautiful cartouches and so books became something that we absolutely loved but we realized the best thing to do was to become a um, general bookstore so that people could come in not just looking for rare things of course we could help them with the rare but we could also supply them with the beautiful classics like Hemingway and everything else like that one of the other really gorgeous books that we have in our collection is over here we also deal in early uh, rare Bibles so this one's one of my favorites. It's the Martin Luther uh, from 1765. It has over 400 illustrations on the inside of it. It's a hand tool binding and beautiful metal uh, pieces that are guards on it, everything else like that. It's quite stunning. But, you know, we're very lucky. People don't realize that living in this part of the country, we have so much history surrounding us from the 16, 1700s that just exists in barns and everything else like that. So when we bought this beautiful Bible, which is what they call the family Bible from 1793, um, inside of it had these beautiful silhouettes. These probably date around 1812 when they came out of the thing. And if you look closely at these up here, these are, we would call early photography. That someone stood by someone had them turned sideways and actually cut that out with a pair of scissors. And if you look really closely, you can even see the eyelash, which had to be cut with the, the most perfect things. And there's a man and a woman, and these probably date right around 1813 to 1815, around the War of 1812, which is really, really cool. So um, we were very lucky a few years ago, we were able to purchase a house that dates um, from 1808. It's one of the surviving houses of the War of 1812. And so these beautiful books here are actually um, all plays from New York dated around 1812. So they'll eventually be treated and they'll go in our house as part of our collection or everything else like that because with the house you have the beautiful books and everything yeah. else for the history and everything else like that, which is pretty cool. Now through here we have a variety of things. Again, we became a generalist, so we have nice first edition copies of a lot of original mystery authors and everything else, but we also get some of the more unusual things like um, things like Rotocrucian uh, Society, Masons. Um, the one I love is there's this guy named George Van Tassel who 
had an experience with the UFOs in the 1950s. These are two of his books down here. They're extremely rare. Um, he believed that he communed with them, I guess, and uh, he created this uh, structure out in the middle of the West that uh, he started having conventions at and everything else and believed it was a place that he could channel the, the individuals and everything else like that. But his stuff is extremely hard to find. And every once in a while, things just pop up from a collection we bought many years ago. And it has these fascinating books on UFOs. This one here is The Planet Mars and Its Inhabitants, written by Eros Eurydes, a Martian. <laughs> and, and then we have things like uh, ships from other worlds, etc. So you get a little bit of everything. Thing. Now, if you're more into the art side of it, we have The Beautiful Native of Hearts by Maxwell Parrish, which is quite that. rare. And then you have uh, beautiful pieces in art and everything else like that. So we kind of go the full gambit. Uh, the whole idea is that we want people to uh, find something for everybody. Of course, the joy for me is the costumes because it gives me a chance to share all the beauty. And I keep dreaming that uh, if you build it, they will come. Yes. So. I keep hoping that Jennifer Hudson will walk through the door and go, I understand you have my dresses here. <laughs> and, and you never know. Yeah, I'll be amazing. So, you know. uh, let me show you one other thing down here. Thrillers, horror. Sports, a little bit of everything. Oh, all, for everything. all the book fans. So one of the fascinating crossovers is sometimes you collect costumes of things that took place in town. Uh, this is a beautiful dress from the movie Tuck Everlasting. This was actually filmed in Habit Grace at Bully Rock. And this particular dress is actually photographed, play her playing croquet wearing this. This was shot here around 2002. And they shot here and they shot in Berlin, Maryland and Rock State Park, which is pretty cool. And then the other thing that I mentioned earlier is that we not just collect costumes, we also collect props. So in the preparation for Hunger Games, uh, this one's from Divergent. This is the whole model and you can actually see a photograph of what it looked like when they built it. This is the scene in Mockingjay Part 2 where they're being chased by the sludge and they run across the courtyard into a building and then all the banisters are torn down and so forth and there's a photograph of it here. It's not really a dark scene but this is the actual model they actually created to actually build that building so that they could do all the filming in it and you can see a to scale model of Gale standing in the back so you yeah. get a kind of a feel for the size and everything else but it's really cool when you look at this and then you watch the scene on unfold on the movie you're going like wow that is so cool uh, this is something I would love to get more of is more models to kind of show off all the tremendous amount of work that goes into film now how did you come across these pieces same kind of thing is a lot of connections a lot of talking to people from all over it's um, um, it's really, uh, I believe it's a mixture of luck. I believe it's a mixture of uh, good friends knowing that you collect. I think it also really makes a difference when people realize you're passionate about something because as you as they realize you're excited about it, they know you're going to care for it and that you're going to take care of it and that you're going to display it in a way that maybe they can't, but in a way that um, the whole world can see it. And I think that passion sometimes opens up more doors and stuff like that. But it's also constantly looking. I mean, my wife thinks I'm crazy. I mean, I'm always on the phone checking everything going, oh, look at that. And sometimes you can miss something by 15 seconds. Easy yeah. as that. Oh, yeah. And it's a lot of research, too. you got to know what you're looking at. It, you know, so often... Anytime there's money involved, mm -hmm. uh, there will always be someone out there trying to take advantage of the of people. So I think that uh, you have to be, you have to do your own research. You have to be willing to ask the questions. And the hard part is sometimes while you're asking the question, somebody else is grabbing it up. So you have to kind of find a balance. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a price that you think you can afford and you don't think it's nuts, um, sometimes it's worth taking the chance on it. Sometimes you're going to win. Sometimes you're going to lose. Um, I remember a wonderful conversation conversation with a guy one day we were talking about westerns and he asked me had I ever seen Young Guns 2 costumes and I said yeah I had one but they're really rare to find and he said yeah I've been looking at one I'd seen one come up for auction but it was really all extensive and he sent me the link and I said yeah sometimes finding them they're almost impossible well we finished our conversation maybe at four o'clock in the afternoon online we were talking back and mm -hmm. forth that evening at midnight I got a, on a 
uh, a a call or a check on my phone saying that something new had been listed and it was a costume from Young Guns 2 and by Baltazar yeah and uh I immediately sent the guy a message and I didn't expect to hear anything because it was midnight. Well, of course, it was only nine o'clock in California because then that's where it was. The guy responded right back. He said, no, you're going to hold on the price. Uh, he bought it from a guy at a flea market and uh, it looked like it had a lot of good provenance and stuff. So I immediately pulled out the film at midnight, put in the Blu-ray, started scanning for the things, confirmed on the costume a couple different things, and I immediately paid for it and got it in, and it was the real deal. So, but there again, I made this decision probably in 30 minutes and spent a lot of money, and it could have missed it just like that, but it's like, you you gotta go with your gut feeling and everything else like that, so. Last time I was here, we had the Western. Yes. Uh, oh, that was the uh, Young Center. Guns too. Yeah. 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 And then I, again, I met another guy who, he his advertisement was not really good. Didn't look really beautiful, but I sent him a couple messages. Turned out he was the executive producer for the film, and when the film ended, he was given the costume for the main person, and he had just put it in storage all these years. And then when he pulled it out, he asked his son if he was interested. His son said no, and he put it up for sale and it had all the provenance and all the background, and everything else. Very crazy film. Yeah. Uh, Clint Eastwood's son, uh, Scott Eastwood, was in it. Uh, he's done done some very unusual films. Mm-hmm. Uh, the now one he did recently wasn't bad at all, but the Western one was. Uh, Diablo and uh, but he has beautiful costume uh, beautiful oil skin jacket and everything else smelled with oil because you know they drench yeah. it to keep the waterproof and everything else like that really cool costume great experience and there again you have to be open to looking at different things and so forth you know, I mean everyone has their genres I'm not a big horror fan because I know how crazy they can get yes we're uh, crazy. yes you yes. are crazy <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I have, I'm a crazy about Hunger Games, and I'm crazy about um, you know certain films like Beautiful Creatures and everything else like that. And mm-hmm. so we're always hunting, so that makes a big difference. So. That's good. And then these are from The Last Airbender, which was filmed partly up in Philadelphia. Just for the, the anime movie did, fans. Yeah, I mean, I hate that. Uh, they hate the live action film, but the costumes were absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they were created by the same costume designer that did Hunger Games. And uh, the detail and the research and everything else. There's even paintings along the seams and everything else and design work. Uh, the quality is just absolutely amazing. So wow. forget the fact that if you have uh, have a problem with the yeah. anime versus live, just look at the costumes and realize the amazing. detail and work that went into it. It was really phenomenal. The craftsmanship was beautiful. Oh yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. And they film up in Philly because M. Night Shyamalan lives there, so he likes to film around his house. Tons of books here for you guys. I think so she said DVDs, vinyl. This is an amazing shop. Well, John, it, it was a pleasure. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. No problem at all. Kathy Ann? Thank you, Isaac. I need a plastic bag. Oh. <laughs> it was really nice. Yes. Pleasure. And come back and see you. us. I look forward to it. And send me a link to all this, okay? I sure will. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Another amazing video, guys. I'd like to thank John and the staff. Please check them out if you're ever in the area. All right, guys. Thank you for coming to the Hard Room. I'm Travis Bruce. I'm going to see you next time. Take care.